behalf of the Hassan Fairness Institute for International Public Policy and International Affairs here at AUB, uh, we are extremely pleased and, and honored to, to be hosting this panel um, on uh, the civil society in the post-9-11 era. And it's, it's particularly important for us at the Institute for, at, at the IFI, at the Institute for the Fairness Institute for uh, Public Policy and International Affairs, because the programs that we're trying to develop in, in particular the international affairs side of the, of the Institute very much relate to post-Cold War and post-9-11 events and the general political, legal, security uh, situation in particular in the region uh, as a result of this. So this, uh, this panel and these two books that are, that we're, that are going to be discussed today um, are, going, are obviously extremely relevant to our own research here at AUB at, at the Institute and for many of you as students and, and faculty and, and uh, the general audiences here at UB. Um, a couple of notes before I introduce the, the, the panel. Uh, one is that um, we are, we have, the, the, this panel is it's, it's a bit different than normal. We have, this, there are two books that I'll introduce in just a second that we're going to be, that are going to be discussed and there'll be a book signing afterwards. So following the panel there'll be a book signing and uh, a, a reception for all of you who have uh, joined us here are welcome to, to join in. And um, I think the, the authors will maybe explain that there might be some kind of discount for the books for those of you who are interested, but uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave the authors to, to talk about that. Um, in terms of the modalities, uh, each of the speakers on the panel, we've got three, three panels really and a discussant. And what, what we agreed is, is uh, in order to, to try to have as much as possible interactive discussion, is for the panelists to make their presentations in as in a, a short a period as possible, maybe around 10 to 15 minutes or so if possible, each uh, followed with by <coughs> discussant remarks. And then we'll open it up uh, to, to, uh, to questions from the audience. And we'll try to have as much as possible an interactive discussion, um, because it's obviously very pertinent issues for all of us here. Um, okay, so I, 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 it's, there's, not, there's not much point in making extensive, uh, presenting all the biographies because we have a very distinguished panel here. And just listing the, the, uh, the scholarship and the publications from, from the eminent scholars here will take us perhaps 10 or 15 minutes, and I don't want to lose too much time on this. So if this is okay with the panel, I'll do just some very short introductions and allow uh, especially Professor Powell to how to, to introduce the, the project in, 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 more, in more fully with all the concepts that go with it. Uh, professor Jude Howell is a professor of development and is the director of the Center for Civil Society at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She's written extensively on civil society issues, the politics of development, security, and civil society. Uh, also issues such as governance, gender, labor relations, and a host of other issues that are, that are on the intersection, let's say, of development, politics, and society. Uh, she's co-authored, as, as I said, numerous books and articles in peer-reviewed journals and, and, uh, and academic uh, journal and publication houses, including uh, civil society and development, governance in China, and in, ser in search of civil society, market reform, and social change in contemporary China. So uh, a whole host of, of issues, both theoretical, conceptual, but also um, with, with particular focuses in, in certain regions. Uh, her many areas of expertise include, as we said, politics of aid, and this is an important theme to, this, to these books, uh, the politics of aid and development policy, uh, civil society and development policy, governance, civil society, aid and security. She also ex uh, has plenty of experience, of course, in gender issues, labor relations, and the politics of the policy process, which is also very relevant for us at the Institute, uh, at the Paris Institute. Uh, she's conducted uh, research not just uh, in, in, in her host university, but also has had plenty of, uh, of field research in countries such as India, Mozambique, Kenya, Central Asia, and Afghanistan. And she's, Professor Howell has, of course, uh, also advised and consulted widely uh, through UN, uh, a number of UN agencies, uh, Ford Foundation, uh, and a, a number of, of NGOs and international organizations such as Save the Children and Christian Aid. Um, Dr. Howell will present first, uh, she will pre present the, the, over, the overview and the general concepts for these two projects and perhaps explain uh, the, the research project itself to which we are coming, to which these, these books fall under, which, are, which the research project is entitled 
the global war on terror, non-governmental public action, and aid. And the two books that have come out of this, and to which there will be a book signing afterwards, uh, are two of the main research uh, outputs that come out of this research project at the Center for Civil Society. So I'd, I'd like to introduce Professor Howell, and then perhaps one by one, I will, I will, I will introduce them one by one. Next show. Um, <coughs> Right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to AUB and uh, Karen and Democracy and everyone involved in organising the roundtable today. It's a great honour for us to be here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your experiences, views, and ideas. Um, the, the presentation today concerns the effects of the war on terror, global security regime, on civil society and aid. Um, now, it's important because when Barack Obama took up his position of president in um, early 2009, one of the first things he did was to actually distance himself from the language of the war on terror, a language that was very much associated with President Bush. Um, in fact, the UK government had already in 2006, December 2006, had already banned the language of the war on terror as they moved towards a dual, a hard and soft approach to counter-terrorism. When Barack Obama abandoned the language of the war on terror, he also undertook to rid America of some of the most pernicious aspects of the war on terror regime, such as he, he promised that he would close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, that uh, he would ban the use of torture, and in particular, water. So, all of this might suggest to us that the war on terror is now over, it's a chapter gone, an era, um, a bygone era, something that is now belongs to history. Um, but I would suggest that this interpretation of events would be overly sanguine. International troops are still in Afghanistan, there are still conflicts in Iraq, and some of them are still alive, and the names and ideas of Al-Qaeda still have currency. Um, but it's, it's really not just about Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, of the two books we have suggest that the war on terror regime is actually a security regime that transcends particular administrations, and many of its effects remain deeply embedded, and that is why we need to be concerned, because the language of the war on terror may be abandoned by our politicians, but its effects, its policies, its uh, legislation and its practices still re remain firmly entrenched, and these have consequences for us as civil society actors and also for international development agencies. So, um, in our research, looks at the effects of the war on terror regime uh, in three particular case studies in the in the co-authored book, uh, in Afghanistan, Kenya, and India, and in a range of countries in the edited. And uh, my colleagues today will speak about the particular experiences in, Africa, uh, in Kenya and in um, Lebanon. Now, we chose the cases of Afghanistan, Kenya, and India in particular in the co authored book because they provided an interesting contrast uh, of political regimes. So, in Afghanistan, we have the case of a country in conflict with weak state, very fragile state, dependent on foreign aid. Kenya, as Germany will explain, is a country that is newly democratizing, had weaned itself off uh, international aid, and had a fairly relatively vibrant civil society that had come to, um, that had become very active in the campaign for multi-party democracy. And the third case was India, which was a long-established um, democratic state with a supposedly very vibrant civil society. So we expected that in India, for example, that civil society actors would be well equipped and ready to resist the uh, potential effects of count new counter-terrorism policies and practices on civil society. And as you will see from our presentation today, things did not always turn out as we expected. Now what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to say a few points about the effects on aid policy and in particular the securitization of aid and then I'll turn most of my attention to uh, civil society. Just, let me just clarify what I mean by the term, the global war on terror regime. 
what we mean by this is that it, it, it's a regime that has, contains a number, number of elements. First, it, um, it is about a mobilizing discourse, a discourse used by national uh, and global political leaders to mobilize people around the security objectives. It suggests a polarized vision of the world that pits freedom against um, oppression, civilization against barbarism, and modernity against backwardness. The very language itself is militaristic, and it points to a global reordering, a shuffling around of allies, a shuffling around of enemies, and it points to a new set of institutional and policy arrangements, as, for example, closer relations between security ag agencies and different parts of the so let me first say a few words about the securitization of aid. Um, since 9-11, what we have seen is a deepening securitization of aid, a process that was already underway in the 1990s, but has become more um, entrenched since 9-11. And this is manifested in a number of ways. We can see it in the direction of aid flows. We can see it in the increased volumes of aid going to frontline states, such as Afghanistan, such as Iraq, such as now Pakistan. We see it in the statements by political leaders, global political leaders, and the heads of development institutions that link poverty with terrorism, as though there is some causal really relationship between poverty and terrorism. I will give you many quotes of this if you try to do it in the QA. We see it in the greater coordination between defense institutions, diplomacy institutions, and development institutions. And as Hillary Clinton said in an address to the State Department when she uh, took on her new position, there are three legs to the school of American foreign policy, defense, diplomacy, and development. And this is what you might call a whole of government approach uh, to security issues. We also see it in the use of aid uh, as a soft measure to court Muslim communities and to prevent extremism. We see it in the development and foreign policies, and we also see it domestically, as in the UK, in the attempt by the UK government um, to support, to, to channel funds into uh, community cohesion projects, which have the purpose, actually, of preventing radicalization, radicalization and extremism. And finally, we see it also in uh, greater engagement by the military in development and relief work, which raises a whole host of issues for humanitarian is uh, workers um, that challenge the very ideas of uh, the principles of neutrality, of independence and impartiality. And Jeremy will be uh, saying some, of, talking about some of these issues in detail in relation to Kenya. But let's, let me move on now to civil society. And there are really five points I want to make. Um, what have been the effects on civil societies? And we thought this was important to look at because after 9-11, a lot of attention was given to the impact on human rights and civil liberties. It is the human rights lawyers, the human rights activists that uh, spoke up about the effects of, human, of um, new security regime practices and policies on human rights and civil liberties. And that was quite right. But what was happening to civil society? And that's what this research is concerned to find out. So the first thing is that we see a veil of suspicion cast over civil society in general. And that's interesting because the 80s and the 90s were in many ways the golden era of civil society, when civil society could do no harm and there were very many uh, expectations of civil society civil society would seen as an essential agreement of democratization. Now a veil of suspicion is cast over civil society, and civil society, one might say very crudely, uh, that it is being divided into a good part and a bad part. A good part that, that needed to be courted, nurtured, and drawn into security agendas, and a bad part that needed to be controlled and surveyed and monitored. Now, in doing so, certain parts of civil society came more under scrutiny or came uh, more under into the attention of government for the purposes of courting and dialogue. So, for example, we see particular attention given to 
Muslim, Muslim communities and Muslim organizations such as Islamic bookshops and mosques and madrasas and so on. Um, we see and particular attention given to Muslim charities because charities anyway were now coming under suspicion. And with a new uh, clause in the special recommendations under the Financial Action Task Force, charities will now have to be scrutinized uh, with regard to their international financial transactions. So there was also um, considerable uh, suspicion about what charities were doing, but particularly Muslim charities and also charities that worked in conflict situations, say in the Middle East, um, um, for example. And what um, the particular challenge for many of these international NGOs that were working in conflict uh, situations was that now um, any organization that received US, US funds had to get their partner organization to sign anti-terrorist certificates, saying that they uh, did not have any association with terrorism. None of those staff had relatives or friends or had any engagement with terrorist um, organizations. And of course, these uh, new anti-terrorism certificates, in some contexts, they did not have any particular effect, but in conflict contexts, they were particularly meaningful and created a lot of issues around how to maintain trust with partner organizations, how to maintain that trust, which takes years to build up. And uh, NGOs have also complained about the extra administrative burden that these uh, forms of uh, monitoring take. Um, as I mentioned, we also see the use of soft measures, both domestically and ex externally, uh, where civil society actors are used as a resource and ally in security strategies. And um, it's interesting also, because apart from the direct effects of the new global security regime on civil society, we also see several uh, secondary effects. And here there are three things that I think are particularly interesting. First, we see that poor and vulnerable and marginalized groups tend to be uh, at the sharp edge of counter-terrorist policy. So for example, in India, most of the people that have been arrested under the Prevention of Terrorism Act when it was in force are actually poor farmers, tribals, Dalits, people um, who it's easy to pick up and um, who become too vulnerable to the abuse of um, counter-terrorism legislation and policy. Secondly, we see governments using the language of the war on terror, use the language of terrorism um, to get at their opponents. This is evidenced, and there are many examples in the books of how this has occurred in Uzbekistan, um, in India, in China, and so on. And the third effect is the normalization of the exception. And I can give you so many of these examples of this in my own country, um, where everyday protest, everyday protest against, for example, the arms trade, or against uh, animal rights, or whatever, um, is being um, undermined through the use of counter-terrorism legislation and people are being detained or arrested under counter-terrorism legislation for what is actually normal political activity in the liberal democracy. Um, and the final point I would like to make is about how civil society is responding to this because this is one of the very interesting findings on our research that, of course, we had expected in countries with vibrant civil societies, or supposedly vibrant societies like India, US, or the UK, that there would be um, quite a big response to um, some of the uh, sharp edges of counter-terrorism policy. But it's been surprising how mainstream civil society has been actually quite silent until um, actors themselves have been directly affected by the policy. Almost as though, well, this is a problem of Muslims, um, it's not a matter of concern to us. And this almost implies theoretically that somehow the organizations and the organizing by Muslim communities is somehow outside of civil society. So it raises an awful lot of conceptual and theoretical questions about how we understand civil society. And of course, practically, 
it uh, makes it, it leads one to think that well, you know, what is happening with mainstream civil society? Do we see the depoliticization of civil society in their silence and crisis? So, um, as we can see, that the 9/11 regimes have a number of effects on aid policy and on civil society. I've given a very general outline of some of our findings. Um, all the details are in the two books, and I'll now hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sherry Lind, to talk in detail about the case of Kenya. Let me just quickly introduce to Dr. Lind. Uh, Jeremy Lind, thank you very much, Professor Howard, for, that, for, for your introduction. Uh, Jeremy Lind is a development geographer with over 10 years' research and advisory experience on livelihoods in conflict areas and the difficulties of aid delivery in such contexts. Um, uh, Professor Lind is currently a research fellow at the Institute uh, of Development Studies at the University of Sussex and is also a research associate of the Center for Civil Society at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, he is, uh, as well as extensive fieldwork experience in North, in North East Africa, I think in particular, where he's lived and worked for three years as a research fellow at the Nairobi-based International Research Institute. More recently, he's worked on Afghanistan and India, conducting research with international donor aid agencies, local civil society, human rights activists, and lawyers. Uh, he has plenty of advisory experience as well, consultancy experience, working for such institutes and uh, NGOs as Oxfam, Christian Aid, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, and he's of course co-author of the two books here with uh, Professor Howell, um, in particular, counterterrorism, aid, and civil society before and after the war on terror. So please, Professor Lynch, who's going to talk today about the case of Kenya. Thank you very much. And I just also want to emphasize the very warm welcome that we've had here in Beirut. Um, it's a real honor to come here and to discuss the findings of our research with you. And we look forward as well to very robust discussion and, and feedback. Um, well, uh, we, we thought it would be quite useful to give you some more detailed findings from one of our country case studies. Um, Jude has given an overview of the more theoretical and general findings of our research. Um, but something that was very important in our work was, was noting that how the war on terror unfolded um, depended very greatly on different political contexts. So we saw very different manifestations of the war on terror um, in different uh, in different places. Um, so in that regard, it's very it's very interesting, and useful for us to reflect um, in greater depth about particular uh, particular political situations. Um, so just to provide a bit more background about the case of Kenya, which again, um, as Jude mentioned, we had three country case studies: Afghanistan, Kenya, and India, um, and. Uh, our, our thinking in choosing the case of Kenya was that this was a recently established democracy. Um, since the 1990s, Kenya has had a multi-party democracy. Um, in East Africa, it has um, probably the largest political space for, um, for debate. Um, a rather robust civil society, um, a very strong independent media as well. Um, and in this context, we would expect that civil society would more strongly and effectively assert its own interests in defending an independent space for deliberative politics and action. Um, certainly compared to a country such as Afghanistan that is still in conflict and heavily reliant on international military and economic assistance. Now there are other particular traits of the political context in Kenya that make it an interesting case. Um, Again, as I mentioned, it has quite wide political space, and this has opened greatly over the last 10 years, uh, since the election in 2002 brought to power a reformist um, coalition of parties. Um, but happening alongside this has been um, an ever-increasing fragmentation of the country along ethnic and regional lines. So although the political space is opening, the country is also dividing um, more and more, and levels of social violence have been worsening over recent years, even as Kenya becomes more democratic. Um, it's also significant that Kenya is in uh, a region of spiraling instability. Um, uh, Somalia is, uh, uh, borders Kenya to the north and to the east, and this has opened up as a new 
front line of the war on terror and recent tears. Um, and on Christmas Eve 2006, the United States supported uh, an invasion of Somalia by um, Ethiopian forces, which were acting as proxy forces for the United States. Um, and this was to remove the Islamic Courts Union, which briefly ruled southern Somalia in 2006. And the United States alleged that um, the Islamic Courts Union was aligned to Al Qaeda. Um, the result of this invasion was that um, the region um, fell into an ever deepening conflict. Um, there have been uh, terrorist attacks aligned with Al Shabaab, which is a new militant movement that arose out of the ashes of this invasion in 2006. There have been various attacks by Al Shabaab um, throughout uh, the region, including this year in Uganda during the World Cup, at a viewing party for the World Cup. There was bombing that killed over 60 people <coughs> in, uh, in the capital city of Uganda. Um, now, just thinking a bit more than about the particular role of civil society in Kenya's political development, um, there is, of course, a very long history of civil society involvement in the country's politics, not least the Mau Mau, which was an ethno-political movement in the 1950s that was fighting uh, the colonial state for land rights. Um, and uh, this movement hastened Kenya's independence from Britain in 1963. Um, since then, um, civil society has continued to have uh, a very important role in Kenya's national politics. Um, what we've seen since the 1990s is that foreign donors supported a mushrooming sector in governance, democracy, and human rights. So throughout the 1990s, um, at a time when Kenya was regarded as a near pariah state um, and had a klepto-corrupt regime under the former president, Daniel Moy, donors were channeling their assistance through the civil society sector that was advocating for political and economic reform. So there was a very close association going back between the current crop of human rights and democracy organizations in Kenya and foreign donors. Now, these groups um, uh, supported an opposition coalition of parties that came to power in 2002 in the general election. Um, at the time, many of the leading civil society activists in Kenya came into the, into the new government. So you saw um, several government ministries headed by former human rights activists. And it was a very triumphant moment for civil society in Kenya to see its own leadership brought into very senior, um, senior positions in the, new, in the new government. Now, donors um, also, following the political events in Kenya, decided to shift their assistance away from the democracy and human rights organizations to, um, to the new government um, and began supporting whole sectoral reform programs rather than focusing on supporting specific NGO-initiated projects. Now, after the election, civil society was quite rudderless. So although it was a triumphant moment for civil society to see that it had helped the reformist coalition parties come to power, um, it lost its direction after the election. And what we've seen since 2002 is that civil society itself has fragmented along regional and ethnic divides, much as the country as a whole has. So um, this came to, um, this, uh, this reached uh, a crescendo in 2008 um, after the 2007 general election in December um, when the um, results of the election were disputed. Civil society failed to reach a unified position during the post-election violence and the chaos that ensued. Um, and we've seen that these divisions have persisted since 2008, even through a period of constitutional reform, as Kenya earlier this year um, passed a new constitution and national referendum. So, what then has been happening in relation to counterterrorism in Kenya and how civil society interacted with this? This is what I want to focus on for the rest of the presentation. Um, notably, there has been considerable um, counterterrorism measures, policies passed by the Kenyan government, but all of this has happened outside 
of a legal framework. The Attorney General in 2003 proposed a suppression of terrorism bill, which was strongly opposed by civil society at the time. This is probably one of the rare moments since 2002 where civil society has effectively organized on the national political stage. Um, civil society groups led by human rights organizations, um, Muslim organizations, um, organizations that represented um, political prisoners, um, unified to oppose the, uh, the, the proposed law. And they were also supported by opposition parliamentarians at the time, who controlled, crucially, the Parliamentary Committee on Constitutional Legal Affairs. So they had the support of the committee in Parliament that was charged with reviewing the law and bringing it to a vote. Um, there were many provisions in this bill that were that provided rightful grounds for concern, um, including a provision that um, seemingly targeted Muslims and would criminalize um, people wearing dress that would lead the police to assume that they were terrorists. So of course this raised concerns for Muslims who are a minority population in Kenya. He said that if they were wearing the Muslim robes to prayer on Friday, that they might be arrested by, by the police. There are other provisions in this bill that targeted civil society as well. Now, the Attorney, Gen <coughs> excuse me, the Attorney General withdrew the bill, but what we've seen is that this has not stopped the government from nonetheless pursuing a whole range of counterterrorism measures and policies, which civil society alleged have been introduced through the back door, including the anti-money laundering bill, which included several provisions that were word for word uh, the same that had appeared in the suppression, uh, earlier suppression of terrorism bill. The Kenyan government has also participated in a regional rendition program, which has not drawn very much international media attention, but is still significant. Um, following the Ethiopian uh, US-backed invasion, of Somalia in 2006. There were many fighters from the former Islamic Courts Union that came across the border into Kenya. And uh, the Kenyan police, um, working with elements from the Kenyan military, were searching for alleged um, leaders of the Islamic Courts Union who were um, claimed by the US and Israel to be, um, to be terrorists. Now, many of these um, suspects that were rounded up were renditioned um, through Somalia to Ethiopia, where they were questioned by foreign intelligence personnel. Um, in a few cases, um, some of these terrorist suspects were renditioned to Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay. Um, controversially, these suspects included many Kenyan nationals themselves. So you had a ridiculous situation where the Kenyan government was renditioning their own citizens to uh, Ethiopia and Guantanamo Bay to be where they could be interrogated by foreign intelligence um, personnel. Now the other aspect of the counterterrorism regime in Kenya has been that development donors have supported many experimental activities by civil society to work on the war on terror security regime. So for example, the Danish donor Danita has supported a variety of community organizations in Kenya, such as um, a coalition of religious leaders that's working in interfaith dialogue, um, an organization that works for the human rights of Muslims. Um, they provided small grants to these organizations, but within the remit, remit of anti-terrorism. Um, well, how has civil society then more specifically responded to the war on terror regime in Kenya? Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, civil society um, effectively opposed the proposed suppression of terrorism bill. Um, and that is one of the bright spots, really, in our research. As Jude mentioned, um, we expected in countries like the UK, like the US, like India, that have a long-established um, uh, democratic politics and very active and vibrant civil society space, that civil society would have more strongly contested some of the sharp edges of the war on terror regime which was not the case. But here um, in Kenya, a country that is deeply fragmented um, and is newly democratic only since the 1990s, we saw that civil society actually stood up and made its voice heard in these debates. 
Um, notably, Muslim organizations were taking the lead. Um, in particular, there was one organization that documented the rendition by the Kenyan government. They obtained the flight manifest for the flights that took the suspects from Nairobi, um, capital city of Kenya, to Somalia and Ethiopia. And they also followed the whereabouts of the terrorist suspects when they were held in Kenyan, um, Kenyan police cells. So they were following them from one police station to another, um, which the police were doing in order to try to keep the human rights organizations off track, not know where, where they were being kept. Um, importantly, this particular organization that followed their renditions refused any Western donor funding, or for that matter, funding from, uh, from any donor outside of Kenya. And instead, they relied on their own social networks in order to do their work. And arguably that is what made them effective in the advocacy that they did. Sadly, the leader of that organization earlier this year was detained by Uganda under terrorism charges alleged to have had involvement in the World Cup bombing that I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk. And um, when I was in Kenya a few weeks ago speaking with human rights activists, um, there's a feeling that these are very much cooked up charges. Um, and that he's been an irritant to the Kenyan government, which um, worked with the Ugandan government to have him, have him detained. Um, mainstream civil society has been missing in action in most of this. And again, this, is, um, this, has, been, uh, this has been led by Muslim organizations, the opposition to counterterrorism legislation. Many mainstream groups have regarded these as Muslim issues that don't affect Kenyans in general. So what can we take away then from the experience in Kenya? Well, this is a rare case of civil society effectively lobbying and working with politicians to oppose counterterrorism law. So in that regard, there's very much to learn um, from, uh, from Kenya. Um, many aid groups have been missing in action, though. Um, that is, aid-supported groups that have been funded by Western donors have been very reluctant to speak out. And this relates not least to the fear that they have that if they speak out on these issues, that they may come under suspicion themselves. The effects of the war on terror regime have been felt very unevenly. So, um, for example, um, this Muslim civil society leader that I mentioned being detained by the Ugandan authorities. It's hard to imagine in East Africa that um, a senior human rights lawyer, for example, who is Christian or non-Muslim being detained in similar circumstances. So it has been Muslim organizations and individual Muslim activists that have certainly um, been targeted. Um, the problems of civil society of mainstream groups in terms of them finding their voice to speak out, um, arguably they may be connected to the problem of aid as, as an instrument that Western donors use to promote their own political and security objectives. So it is the smaller organizations that don't rely on donor funding who have been more active in Kenya. And what we conclude in the book is that although aid can build the power and authority of civil society, as it did for the democracy, governance, and human rights sector in Kenya throughout the 1990s. Uh, the next panelist is, is uh, Nassim Mansour who is a research fellow at the Refugee Studies Center at the University of Oxford and is also affiliated with the Center for Civil Society at, the, at LSC. And uh, she's completing, will be completing her PhD thesis at LSC's Social Policy Department on the, on the impact of family laws, policy reforms on women's subjectivity and agency in post-conflict Lebanon. Uh, she's also done a lot of research on the influence of political religious institutions on women's identities and collective action and political participation issues in Beirut, Stahe, and Sabah. Uh, and the student is going to present the, the, the Lebanon case study, and please, you have 15 to 17 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here among colleagues and friends, very good friends on each side. And then uh, uh, I will actually aim to speak more than 15 minutes and try my best to do that. Uh, my presentation actually follows from the themes that Jude and Jeremy discussed. I will not be using any PowerPoint uh, presentation, so you will have to bear with me. Um, I will, in this presentation, I will focus on the global, global war on terror discourses 
uh, on the role of the global war on terrorist forces on government and humanitarian responses uh, to populations during the conflict. Uh, during conflict. Uh, this inquiry is important because since 9-11, there is a growing trend of normalizing civilians' losses. Many Western and non-Western states have become less apologetic about compromising civilian lives and breaching international humanitarian law. Instead, uh, governments justify losses by representing populations as less worthy of protection, either as collateral damage, or as human shields, or as legitimate targets or outright terrorists. And we saw this in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the July 2006 war, uh, and many other contexts as well. Uh, in this way, uh, governments are stripping populations from their civilian status. Um, and for that reason, the way populations are represented in official discourses is actually the crucial issue that civil society needs to be concerned with and address. This is important, in my opinion, because it has direct and crucial impact on the way civilians uh, on civilians' entitlements for humanitarian protection and the possibilities for civil society to cater for their needs. Um, the dynamics and implications of these shifting boundaries between civilians and the military uh, are still largely unexplored. There are several valuable accounts that have been concerned with either uh, the state's discourses on global war on terror uh, or another uh, part of the literature deals with legal research on the erosion of the international human rights law. In my research, I try to link these two perspectives to focus on the implications of the lived experiences of concerned populations. Uh, I, uh, in this research, I analyze the dynamics, or I focus on the dynamics of the how, of how governments enact their national security discourses into their humanitarian policies to civilians, who we'll then be global war on terror era. In order to illustrate the argument, I contrast two very familiar uh, conflicts uh, that took place recently. Um, the July 2006 war and the Nahri Barrett clashes in 2007. And what I'm particularly focusing on is um, the contrast uh, within the Lebanese government's response to populations who were affected by these two conflicts. Although the two wars are very different in scope, they were run under uh, a broad anti-terrorism logic that opposes governments or states to militant groups that have specific religious and ethnic attributes and have affected the populations that are linked to them. In selecting these cases, I'm aware that the position and role of the Lebanese government were very different uh, because the government and Lebanon uh, was at the receiving end of Israeli military operations. And it was Israel who used the discourse of anti-terrorism when uh, holding the military operation uh, on Hezbollah. Uh, so that's one difference. Similarly, the, popula the popular and national legitimacy of the two militant groups are also very different. However, this difference does not affect the line of the argument. It provides a contrasting backdrop to show how variable the response or how complex the influence of the local and global security discourses are on civilians. Uh, in order to do that, I did a systematic review of official and government documents, uh, as well as newspapers and magazines articles um, uh, of the Lebanese government statements for the two wars. And uh, in addition, I reviewed the um, documents of civil society or, um, organizations and human rights um, now, for this particular research, my, argu my line of argument is very simple. I argue that the global war on terror discourses provide some discursive tools for governments that, they, that governments can use to compromise the protection of civilian populations. So governments can, can use some um, elements or some concepts of the global war on terror in controlling populations. They use these, the use of these tools, however, is conditional. It's not a blanket use of, uh, of it's not like a completely new era. Uh, the use of these tools is conditional of specific historical and geopolitical 
uh, conditions in the context of both the armed groups and the populations that are involved, and the civilian populations. Uh, these discourses are mixed with older local political discourses that are related to specific social groups. And I will illustrate how I would do that. Uh, to elaborate on the argument, uh, I argue that the government to reconfigure target populations, both as civilians and as military groups who operate within them. And this is done at two levels. Um, actually, before I mention the two levels, I, I need to mention that this is made possible with the global war on terrorist forces in, by using two concepts. The first one is a new sort of very loose definition of what terrorism is. And this um, various definitions are, are not very clear on that. And the second one is a, very, is a very loose definition of what a civilian means. And we can discuss this further in the questions and answers. So governments do this at two levels. The first level is that they classify militants according to, very, to these influences, sorry, in relation to these influences and to very security categories. So governments legitimize or delegitimize militant groups depending on the political situation. Uh, and these categories can, uh, can range from armed resistance, from a legitimate armed resistance, such as the case of Hezbollah, although it, was, it is uh, contested as, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, it was contested and I'm sure now, uh, and up to the illegitimate category of terrorist group as it was used with Islam. The second way that governments do that is that they subsequently redraw civilians in relation to these groups. So they attach uh, civilian populations or the legitimacy to protect civilian populations in relation to their application to the military groups. I will start by illustrating the first point and I'll move to the second. Um, military groups work in the case of Lebanon. Military groups were classified into variable security categories depending on the perceived threat that these groups provided to national security and their intent to harm Lebanese society. Uh, and I'll illustrate with some examples. For instance, in the July 2006 war, the government was not able to use the global war on terror language freely against Hezbollah. The party capitalized indeed on its role as a resistance movement at that time, whose arms were turned outwards towards the enemy. Of course, this has changed after 8 May, uh, the, the events of 8 May, but uh, that was the main narrative then. So then it is interesting to see that the government stance towards Hezbollah was not consistent in the July 2006 war. It shifted considerably as the conflict progressed. The government initially questioned Hezbollah's legitimacy by branding it as a satellite arm of Tehran. And these, uh, these quotes that I will be listing here are all in public documents, and this particular quote was in the Le Figaro of 2006. However, with the sweeping humanitarian crisis induced by the Israeli operations and the persistence of Hezbollah's defense, the government shifted focus and concentrated on Israel as a greater national threat. So that the main offender shifted from being Hezbollah to uh, Israel. The government joined Hezbollah in denouncing Israel, quote, state terrorism, unquote, and gave its discourse away from the group to focus on the humanitarian crisis. And that was very clear in the statements of the prime ministers in Europe. In the reverse uh, of power dynamics, Hezbollah was instead in a position to accuse the government of treason and alignment with, quote, Israel, Lebanon's ultimate enemy. And you are all familiar with how these uh, uh, tensions played during the, um, the July 2006 war. In contrast, Fakhil Islam's threat to national security was spread very quickly in its intention to harm the state's national symbol, which is the Lebanese army, which is an institution that is uh, portrayed in official discourse as above any, um, uh, any internal tensions or above any sectarian or political tensions. The threat of the group was also articulated in terms of its irrationality. For instance, the Lebanese Minister of Defense described the group as cancerous cells 
that could multiply. And these, uh, these terms were very, uh, very common in, in the discourses. Uh, the Tigris link with Fatul Islam, between Fatul Islam and al qaeda was soon established, immediately established, despite any contradictory evidence or any missing evidence for that. The government's response was framed with uh, an anti-terrorist language, such as, quote, eradicating the group. And uh, much of this language was used in the official documents that reminds very much of the language that Bush was using with <coughs> Iraq and uh, in Afghanistan as well. Um, in that sense, uh, the practices of the government also reflected this approach. And the army was able to impose a blockade on the camp and uh, to conduct a systematic, systematic indiscriminate bombing of the Nagarbari camp, as you all know. Now, how, how does this reflect on the categories of civilians, or the, the populations that, that are associated with the, these groups? The concern with the population's protection followed the government's categorization of militants. So populations were categorized according to varying degrees of civility and different <coughs> rights to protection. In the July 2006 war, for example, the Lebanese government shifted its discourse from blaming Hezbollah to the welfare of civilians only nine days after, uh, nine days into the conflict. At the start of the conflict, it, 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 it went from blaming Hezbollah for their, quote, bad timing, unquote, to denouncing Israeli attacks as an, quote, aggression against the civilians and the vital institutions of the country. And this shift was very clear in the official documents uh, that were researched. In this shift, uh, southern populations were placed at the center of multiple governmental humanitarian appeals and were represented simultaneously as innocent victims and valiant people of Lebanon. And in that sense, the focus shifted towards the civilians. And at the same time, any reference to Hezbollah was completely dropped from the official in the case of Nahri Barrett clashes, in contrast, the entire Palestinian populations of the camp were included under the terrorist militant category. Periodic statements from the Minister of Defense and the Chief of Army drew links between inhabitants of Fatih Islam, mainly focusing on cultural and social ties, and fusing the two groups together. Uh, talk about marriage to, to Palestinian women in the camp was very common. Uh, also mention of the joint criminal activities between the inhabitants and Fatul Islam uh, militants was also repeated in the discourses. Um, these categorizations legitimized the breach of international humanitarian law and refugee law in several ways, and I, and I uh, note them. Um, most importantly, all fleeing inhabitants were considered terrorist suspects by default. Everyone in the Hibari was a terrorist suspect. And this was done in three, in three ways. First, the exodus of the populations from the camp was under the tight grip of the Lebanese army. People were searched, and most men were taken into military custody for investigation uh, on their possible links with Fatih Islam. And there were several allegations of harassment, torture, and arrests. Second, there was a systematic forced displacement as the Lebanese army did not allow any inhabitants back into the Nahri Bari camp, even to check on their homes or to check on their relatives that were uh, left behind. Third, the army banned all humanitarian assistance inside the camp, apart from evacuating the wounded. So systematically, it was really a matter of getting people out of the camp, rather than catering for, for who's, who was left behind. In that sense, the Lebanese army considered any inhabitants left behind in the camps uh, as terrorists with no rights of protection. And this is very problematic because there are several vulnerable groups that are usually left behind, like the elderly or the disabled, etc. So how does this affect the protection practices of civilians? With the differential treatment of both groups of internally mm -hmm. displaced persons, the government's approach created a hierarchy of population. Citizens who are deserving of protection and thus who were considered civilians, and other non-citizens who were largely denied from it and were considered non-civilians. 
And that's not the Lebanese government. That's reinforced the definition of civilian as citizen in the following way. First, the government's approach to humanitarian assistance during the period of the conflict consisted the consistently disadvantaged uh, Palestinian population. One indication is by mapping the, uh, the internally displaced population's mobility within the displacement space. If we look in, at the July War of 2006, uh, the displaced southern populations were granted free movement in the country, maybe to the north, to Beirut, and to other areas. Um, and they were hosted in public facilities, including schools and other governmental buildings. Also, the government designated the Higher Relief Commission to the Higher Relief Commission to coordinate the official humanitarian operation, uh, joining leading efforts by various civil society and political actors. Although the government lagged behind, but then it, it tried to join these efforts. Also, it's very important to note that uh, I'm not saying that the government willingly did this. Uh, uh, my whole argument is that it was pushed into doing that uh, for various political and historical reasons. However, in contrast, the displacement map of the Nahibari population suffered a very restricted mobility. The population sought refuge exclusively in other Palestinian camps, mainly al Badawi, whose population almost doubled to around 30,000 people in the first two weeks of the conflict, with very severe humanitarian implications on that. And here, here it's very interesting to note also that Palestinian, the Palestinian displaced from the Hibari, uh, they also choose to go to Palestinian camps because they, they reported that they didn't feel safe to go outside of the Palestinian camps. And this is an indication of the, you know, of the, uh, the threat or the perception of fear and threat that they are subjected to. Uh, another indication of this disparity was at the level of documenting human losses. In the July 2000, 2006 war, the daily coverage of losses focused on civilians, mainly including their names, ages, hometown, with no indications of the losses incurred by Hezbollah militants. And that went on until about halfway through the conflict where the, the massive toll of victims made it impossible to document all the names. But in the first two weeks, it was consistently reported in this way. Uh, in the case of Nahri Barat clashes, the government's focus was actually the reverse. The daily count was concerned with military losses among both the ranks of the Lebanese army and the militants of Hafiz Islam. However, the Palestinian civilian losses were mostly omitted in any official statements. A third indication of that disparity was in the direction of humanitarian assistance. The government had a marginal interest in the welfare of Palestinian IDPs or internally displaced persons. And it focused uh, instead on the Lebanese inhabitants surrounding the camp of the Rebarri. And this was done during the conflict. For instance, the Prime Minister gave quote, instructions to intensify support to these families and found it necessary to attend to these crises to the crisis that the Lebanese are enduring as a result of the Islam aggression. The Palestinian IDPs were hardly mentioned as their needs were completely subcontracted to UNRWA that was perceived to be too major for them. Palestinian inhabitants thus were rendered further invisible uh, as they were included into a new disadvantaged category of refugee IDPs. So initially they were refugees so they had less entitlements than uh, citizens, and now they became displaced as well, which granted them less and less entitlements for protection. The double displacement of the Palestinians then placed them further outside of society. Uh, as the government confounded civilians with citizens, it excluded Palestinians from both the civilian category and the framework of immunity and protection uh, that was granted to so what does this say about global war on terrorist forces, national governments, and the protection of civilian populations? Uh, the research that I conducted showed that the influence of the global war on terror regimes is conditional, actually, upon the socio-political local context. Governments adopted the 
uh, in his discourses, when the legitimacy of the militant groups were, uh, when it was easier to contest the legitimacy of these militant groups. When adopted, these discourses became part of the government's humanitarian security frameworks that contest the civilian status of populations and affects their environments. Most importantly, the variable process of adopting certain security discourses is translated into a very elastic use of the categories of militants and civilians. This definitely makes it hard for, makes it even hard and harder for civil society to claim, uh, not only to provide assistance, but to claim representativeness and legitimacy of these populations that are under conflict. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Uh, and that, that, in fact, concludes the, uh, the, the authors of the, the books, and we've invited my colleague, uh, Dr. Samuel Fenji, from the Department of Political Studies and Public Administration here at AUB, uh, to uh, and we might have to come give some uh, comments as a discussant to this panel. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Fenji re received his PhD in Political Economy and Social Theory in 2008 uh, from the University of Cambridge in the UK. Uh, prior to Cambridge, he had studied, in fact, at LSE and AUB, uh, and his research interests are in the fields of Political Economy and Social Theory, with an emphasis on the Middle East. So, Simon, uh, please, you're invited to talk about 10 minutes on, uh, so as discussant before the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. First, I'd like to simply warn you that I'm not an expert on civil society or, or terror or aid. Uh, neither on the PowerPoint or my book will be quite clear in that sense. Uh, I'll be making some general points which I hope are relevant for the discussion afterwards. And I'd like to note at the beginning that this was a um, very interesting and timely book, timely uh, for us in our current political situation, and it provides us with a theoretical framework and a series of empirical investigation on discussing civil society under strain uh, in this presentation uh, to capture the transformation in uh, our conception of civil society under the pressure of counter-terrorist policies in the 9-11, post-9-11 era. So from a position of broad agreement with the thesis presented in this book, I'll try to engage it in order to probe further uh, what I see as its critical dimension for our part of the world, and to raise also a bit more general question regarding the possible affinities between the war on terror, the discourse and concept deployed by this uh, idea, and less politically motivated discourse that have been circulating around in the development industry, state building, governance issue, and to see what are the possible relations between this political discourse, the war on terror, and what might look like more neutral social scientific <coughs> discourse. So I'll not spend too much time on the thesis since it has already been presented. I will start directly with my general points on the book. Uh, and the first point I noticed, and again, I mentioned that I'm speaking of civil society to understand, is the wide, uh, the wide uh, and uh, enriching broad comparative perspective that has been used in this book. And I think that this is a very good uh, antidote against two dangers when dealing with such questions. It's an antidote against the, the danger of sliding in culturalist interpretation, which has been involved for some time, trying to explain the world better from a culturalist perspective. And more importantly, and this is what I noted by uh, reading the various case study in uh, the society on this chain, is that it's also an antidote against the possible theoretical reductionism. And when you look at the global image that emerges from these various books, we have one where the openness, uh, contingencies and uncertainties and contradiction of the world there are all highlighted by the author. So we have cases where the world there failed or was subverted by local actors, in other cases where it succeeded. And in that sense, the various authors do not shy away from recognizing the complexity in what we mean by the world of death. Mm -hmm. And second book, uh, the second point I'd like to mention uh, pertains to the theoretical framework used by the author in this book. And is, as I mentioned in the introduction, they moved away from the first set of conceptualization of the war on terror, which looked at it as a form of uh, negative set of policies that only restrict or exclude players from entering civil society, to a much wider conceptualization that looked 
not only at this negative moment of exclusion, but also at the more positive moment of transforming certain players, of trying to alter their political identity, of trying to alter their subjectivities in order to fit into the requirement and the goal of uh, the war on terror. In that sense, they will look at the war on terror as a regime and not simply a set of top-down policies that are used to exclude certain uh, uh, players. And I think that this is a very interesting idea because it allows us to include in this concept of the war on terror a number of initiatives and practices that have been going on that politically seems to be unrelated to the war on terror, but in some manner indirectly fit into this conception. I'm thinking of a number of reports or research that has been done trying to distinguish between good and bad Muslims or trying to distinguish between good and bad civil societies. I don't know if I'm making a, too much of a wild uh, interpretation here, but the various UNDP Arab reports that were published in the last decade or so do make such sometimes such assumptions. And when we reconceive or re uh, think about the war on terror as a regime, we have also to think about how these various politically neutral initiatives might actually be uh, reappropriated by the war on terror for politically motivated issues. And I think that the author rightly note that the war on terror might continue after the Bush administration and despite the softer rhetoric of President Obama. And I think that this is a point that I'll come back to later that need to be uh, discussed and explained. What exactly will remain once the political uh, discourse of the war on terror has been so I make two points regarding this thesis, which might go into contradictory direction, but uh, that's okay. The first would ask whether we are reifying to some extent various practices under the rubric of war on terror, and how to account for these contradictions in the uh, outcome of the war on terror and the reappropriation of some of the tenets by war on terror. And the second point that I'm making is whether we have having, on the contrary, too narrow of a conception. And maybe we need actually to widen this conception to include elements which do not seem uh, directly related to the world. Okay. So let me start with the first point. And to illustrate it by looking at the interrelationship between the global war on terror as a global phenomenon and local and domestic politics. And in the book, if you read the various case study, we have at least a story that goes uh, as such. The global war on terror unfolds in various cases depending on the existing uh, regional, local, and domestic politics, and this has great variability and uh, different outcome of the war on terror, leading to different outcomes. So in some cases, it was reappropriated for purely political reasons, such as the construction of Islam and Muslim in India as part of a terrorist network or the recasting of the liberation tiger in Sri Lanka as part of the global discourse on terror. Uh, in some cases, it, uh, it was done for the benefit or for the interest of local players, irrespective of what global U.S. interests might have uh, thought about it. In other cases, such as the case, uh, the case study on Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, often this discourse was used against U.S. interests. It was subverted by the local player in order to make uh, to advance their own interests. I'd like to spend some time on the case study in Lebanon because one, I mean, I'm, it's a sign of our parochialism we like to discuss our own issues or discussing other issues. In order to go into the interest of the case, I might know better uh, the local and the global dimension of this process. Uh, Yassin has presented quite well the story, the argument, and the two contrasting responses between the July War of 2006 and the event in the that we can call it the war in 2006 where basically two different vocabularies have been used in order to map these events, to make sense of them, and then at the end of the day, to allocate more responsibility and uh, aid and humanitarian Even though I, I, I agree with the broad outline of the story, the question really that we need to probe is, is what role did this whole discourse on terror play in influencing these events or in con these two contrasting conceptualizations? And what uh, how to account for the local uh, politics involved in such an event. Of course, war on terror provided, provided a convenient excuse for the government to uh, remove any moral or even legal responsibility towards the Palestinian in the national 
to some extent, this is one could read it also as a simple continuation of what might be one of our consensus in Lebanon, cross sectarian consensus, which is that the racism that exists against Palestinians in camp. And to some extent, the war on terror built on existing imagery in our history. And in order to make a counterfactual point, if it wasn't from the war on terror, would the result of the dealing of the government with the Palestinians be in any case different? And the same case would have to be made regarding the Israeli and their dealing with Hezbollah and the southern population. Again, the war on terror was used in a very convenient manner by the Israelis to justify what they have always been doing, justifying it according to different discourse. So in some sense, the, the question I'm trying to probe is to what extent the war on terror causes uh, in the sense of creating new behavior or creating new possibility, and not simply a form of justification for existing local uh, problems or for existing local patterns of exclusion, racism, etc. Uh, I'm sure that in some of the case study, the war on terror was causally effective, or at least had a much more prominent role in determining the behavior of the government. And in some of the case study, funding, for instance, is one of the powerful tools in order to make the war on terror an effective and mechanism. But in other, it was simply used in a very convenient manner by local players in order to advance their own interests. So I'd like maybe in the, in the discussion we can probe this relation between the global and the more local domestic uh, I'd like to conclude by tackling the second point which pertains to the genealogy of the war on terror, an implicit genealogy presented in, this, uh, in the book. And at various points, uh, the editors and the various contributors note that many of the elements that compose the war on terror have longer genealogy than simply the neocon administration of the war on terror of 9 And most of them emerge actually in the post World War 19 month. So in some sense, one could say that the war on terror did not emerge extremely out of a completely uh, blank situation where basically humanitarian concerns were of prime importance. There has been work conceptually at least, preparing not necessarily the war on terror per se, but at least some of the mechanism and the question and the problematic that was taken up by the war on terror. I mean, mentioning just three that I'm slightly aware of. I'm Civil society, for instance, has been uh, an idea, a concept that has been circulated for some time among the development industry and is leading different conceptualization, leading, in some cases, to the beginning of a distinction between good and bad civil society, which one are pro-democracy, which one are against democracy, which one are pro-development, which one could fit in the global good governance agenda and which are opposed to it. Uh, another uh, debate has been going on for uh, uh, sometimes a debate on sovereignty. Uh, the whole idea of international financial uh, institution and the legitimacy of their intervention has been a topic circulating among the development industry. Humanitarian intervention has also questioned to a large extent the notion of sovereignty. I think in one of the panels of the UN there had been an attempt to rebrand sovereignty as a responsibility in order to justify some form of breaching of sovereignty in order to satisfy humanitarian intervention. So, these have been already circulating among the development industry before being reused by the war on terror. Secreti secretization also has a longer history, which I think would be uh, the middle of the 1990, uh, the question that economics and conflict, or economics and conflict are related to some extent. Uh, the beginning of an economic analysis of civil war, the emergence of some department in the World Bank, I think they have a department on the economics of conflict and dealing with post conflict society, the work of Paul Collier in that sense, is a sign of the emergence of this literature. What I'm trying to say is that most of these concepts have been circulating in the galaxy of the development industry, and they took a specific articulation with the war on terror, there is no doubt. Uh, they took them, they provided them to a certain political dimension, they provided them, of course, with an army that would actually impose them, but they have been around for some time. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that the durability of this discourse of the war on terror might persist not simply because of U.S. interest or because of the softer rhetoric that is hiding the global, more sinister war, but because all of these practices and concepts are continuously are continuing to circulate in our development industry. One could even suspect that attacking the war on terror might be a convenient way to avoid asking the more difficult question pertaining to these assumptions and uh, to the conceptual, if you want, environment that allowed the war on terror to emerge. And the second question is, the second point that I'd like to conclude with, 
and whether the war on terror should be an excuse actually to critically re-examine part of our epistemological uh, assumption that has been uh, dominant for some time in the benefit industry, and maybe if you want really to make a critical, in that sense, intervention, it would have to really rethink the basis of the development industry and the basis of uh, these if you want, longer genealogy than simply sticking to the war on terror. And I hope I, I managed to do it in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody on the panel for, for both of you, but also extremely interesting uh, comments on, from everybody.